Again, thank you for having me here. Um, today, I'm just going to be presenting some preliminary findings from a study that, uh, a collaborative study of um, segregation and um, birth outcomes among Black immigrant um, mothers in New York City. Um, as, as you all probably know, um, preterm birth is defined as a gestation, a birth prior to 37 weeks gestation, and low birth weight is defined as uh, birth weight uh, equal to or less than 2,500 grams. Um, and preterm birth and low birth weight are associated with um, developmental outcomes, um, so associated with adverse uh, developmental outcomes, and in, including motor development, motor function, um, emotional and behavioral outcomes. It's also um, associated with increased risk of um, chronic illness among, among infants who are born preterm and have low birth weight. And that includes asthma and respiratory distress. Um, in 2019, it was estimated that um, preterm birth and low birth weight contributed to 31, 30, nearly 31% of the top five causes of infant mortality in the US. Um, and I think that that just underscores why it's important to study um, dis dis disparities or inequities in birth outcomes among racialized immigrants, particularly Black immigrants. Um, so I wanted to start by acknowledging my co-author. Um, the first author under study is Sarah L. McLafferty, a professor at Ge in the Geography and GIS Department at University of Illinois. And uh, my other collaborator, uh, my other Collaborator is Sue Grady, um, who's a professor in the geography and uh, in geography, environment, and spatial sciences department at Michigan State. Um, they have they've actually been doing this research longer than I've been alive. Um, it's been such an honor to work with them. So, why Black immigrants? Um, so between nineteen 1998 and 2001, the infant mortality rate for U.S. population was estimated at 7.28 per 1,000 births, um, and that's compared with 5.29 per 1,000 births for immigrants overall. However, Black immigrants had an infant higher infant mortality rate compared to their non-Black Im uh, immigrant uh, counterparts at 10.21 per 1,000, but nearly twice as high. Um, so, I mean, why, that's obviously why it matters, but also understanding that Black immigrants are a, a significant and growing share of the Black population here in the United States. Um, the population share of Black immigrants has actually doubled over the last three decades. And um, immigration from African nations has actually outstripped immigration from the Caribbean in this period. And overall, few studies actually few studies address birth outcomes among Black immigrants in the United States. Um, but the extant literature in this area does suggest that Black immigrants experience worse out health outcomes, and that's including birth outcomes, as with the long with long, and that's associated with longer tenure in the United States. And also, you also see worsening health outcomes uh, across generational cohorts. Um, overall, preterm birth and low birth weight are, are highest among US born Black women compared with Black immigrants. However, again, Black Americans have comparatively higher rates of preterm birth and low birth weight compared to non Black immigrants. Um, and prior studies have shown that racial segregation is predictive of preterm birth and low, uh, low birth rate uh, among uh, U.S. born and uh, immigrant Black mothers in the U.S. Okay. Um, so racial inequities in birth outcomes. Um, I'm sure many of us have seen these studies uh, and these statistics, but the risk of preterm birth um, was 3.2 and 4.4 percentage points higher for U.S. born Black mothers compared with immigrant Black mothers and U.S. born whites, respectively. Um, patients admitted in hospitals that serve majority Black residents have higher rates of maternal, uh, maternal morbidity, so we're talking about mothers here, and these hospitals are also more, li more likely to be located in segregated urban service, urban service areas. 
However, it's important to also consider um, the segregation as experienced by the mother and, and um, infant, or you know, in this case, fetus, I guess. Um, it's important to consider the residential context of the mother during pregnancy. Um, so in New York City, the association between admission to, uh, to a majority black serving hospital and severe maternal mort uh, morbidity was stronger among mothers who resided in zip codes that were, re that were segregated by race and income. Um, and I wanted to emphasize one big one thing. Uh, I don't know if, you, if you're on Twitter, you might have seen the hashtag racism, not race. And um, so here's one of my favorite quotes that kind of sums up, is a pretty good definition of racism, I think. Racism is the state sanction and or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Um, and uh, I'll explain this a little bit more, but it's really important to think about racism as a, a broader social structure. Uh, think about it, particularly structural racism. It structures, the, it's, in one way we can think about it too, is it's a, racism drives the social spatial distribution of resources and hazards. So in, in that way, it also drives inequities in health among, along the axes of race and class and so forth. Um, here's another quote that's more closely related to the topic at hand. Uh, this is quoted from uh, Dana, Ann, uh, Dana, Dana Ann Davis's book, uh, Reproductive Injustice, uh, Racism, Pregnancy, and Premature Birth. Locating the mother as the site from which in, infant mortality and premature infants um, emanate re reduces complex social and structural etiologies down to the body of the mother. Um, and this is a really this is a really pithy, it packs a lot right here, right? Because we're talking about a um, narrative of mother blame. We're talking about this collapsing of race and racism so that like the effects of racism are collapsed down to race. And that's how you see this particularly in uh, biomedical studies and even studies in public health where they, they adjust for race and consider race as a risk factor. Um, rather than considering race as a relational variable because it is a product of racism. Um, and that's kind of getting at what I hear. So I would say if nothing else, um, I would want everyone to come away with an understanding that race is not biological or genetic. Um, we can't just decompose the inequities and birth outcome, pregnancy related outcome down to the mother's race because um, people who are racialized as Black experience very particular uh, risk. Uh, they're predisposed to certain very harmful, certain ex harmful exposures, including racism-related ra exposure, uh, racial, racism, sorry, racism-related stress, environmental racism, um, and all of that is actually is all actually mediated, and modified, and influenced by racial segregation. Um, and I want to underscore this point that when we talk about race as a risk factor, we're by default implying that race is an individual trait or characteristic, and we're also um, we, we're also not acknowledging that race is a relational factor. It's not just an individual. It's not an individual characteristic. It race is a product of racism, um, and also another another implied assumption. Uh, that is encoded in the statement race is a, as a, is a risk factor is that race is biological um, and race is not biological. Um, but this, like, this um, core belief in, in much of biomedical research has the effect of making it seem that racial inequities in health um, and also healthcare are immutable. And it, and, it take, and it takes away from an understanding that the, the persistence of these inequities is an outcome of the enduring racist structure. Uh, so again, racism is a product of racialization. And racialization is, is basically a, a social, economic, political processes that produce race. Um, and producing race is differentiating within, the pop within populations 
um, by, by characteristics that are imbued with, with racist meaning. Um, and finally, racism. So racism, we can think about, I'm fo mostly focusing on structural racism. Um, we can extend this to talking about interpersonal race racism. But when I'm talking about racism, I'm talking about practices, policies, structures, all of these that pattern the social spatial distribution of resources and hazards and thus the inequitable and inequitable health outcomes. Um, but uh, all of this boils down to when we're talking about racism and health. We have to understand that racism has biological consequences, but that doesn't mean that race is biological. So we have to understand that race is a product of racism and racism produces has biological consequences. And that has, that has longer, longer term consequences for the health and well-being of our, of our community. So um, geography, um, so again, I'm, I'm, my training is in medical geography and um, the overarching framework for this study and much of medical geography is that there's a, uh, is a relational perspective in health geography. So when we're talking about health, the health of populations, the health of community members, we're also talking about the contextual factors. Um, so what are the characteristics of the community that people live, work, play, and learn in? Um, what are the characteristics of the places that these communities are in? And how do they relate with the people? How do they relate with the outcomes, health outcomes among those people? So um, it's also that that incorporate that also talk um, incorporates uh, methods that consider mobility, behavior, perceptions, um, and also so ecological, historical, social, uh, political, economic processes. So so that includes racial segregation, right? Racial segregation just didn't come out of thin air. Um, it, it's a set of patterns and processes and policies that sort people in resident or sort people in terms of where they live also on the basis of how they are racialized on the basis of their income and so forth um and then I, another contextual model or i like this one a lot i use it in my teaching but so the, in biomedical research and public health research, there's been a lot of growing interest in the con in what we have termed the social determinants of health. Um, and the definition of social determinants of health, if you, not, if, if you may not be familiar, I'll read it out loud. The conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. And that includes economic policies and systems, um, social norms, social policies, and political systems. Um, one thing I would say is that so social determinants of health are often collapsed with racism, and that's not accurate. Um, and also, um, at the health system level, um, we often see people talking about social determinants of health and social risk and social needs as interchangeable, and that's not necessarily accurate either. Social determinants of health are outcomes of these fundamental causes that shape the distribution of resources and hazards. Um, and so that includes, so one example of that, and when we're talking about racial segregation, is housing quality, right? So you're gonna see poorer housing quality in, in, in neighborhoods that were previously redlined, uh, or neighborhoods that were designated to be for Black and Latinx residents only, right? So that's going, that's going to have long-term downstream consequences and that's going to, and so when you have poor housing, you're also going to see um, more environment, more harmful environmental exposure. You're going to see more, um, neg more adverse health, health outcomes. By the time a patient who has been living in, a, in, a, in poor housing stock for the majority of their life, they come into an office that you're talking maybe 20, 30 years of exposure. Uh, so by the time they're screened for social uh, or for health, uh, social risk or social needs, many of the uh, actual uh, harms of the exposure are already there. So we can't necessarily collapse uh, social risk and social needs because we are inter with social risk and social needs. You're often intervening at the individual or household level for a problem that is a structural that is at the structural level. 
Um, I like to this this help um, frame my research for me too because I'm mostly focusing on macro social uh, determinants of health, macro social um, causes and determinants of health. Um, so more broadly, immigration and health outcomes. Um, longitudinal data suggests that um, prolonged residence in the U.S. is associated with worsening health status among Black immigrants and, and also within subsequent generations. Um, second and third generation Black immigrants report poorer self-rated health status compared to their first generation counterparts. Um, this includes cardiovascular outcomes, uh, which are very closely related with birth related outcomes, especially when we're talking about preeclampsia and eclampsia, right? Um, and also birth outcomes, so preterm birth and uh, low birth weight. Um, observed declines in health status are sharper among Caribbean, um, Caribbean immigrants than among um, African immigrants in the U.S. Um, and so also thinking about immigration, the nexus of immigration status and race, racism, right? Uh, mothers who are racialized as Black are more likely to experience uh, maternal morbidity and adverse birth outcomes compared to um, other racial and ethnic groups. And um, in the recent re uh, systematic review study, which is very thorough, great read if you want to just read one thing on this topic. Um, the authors found that overall studies in this area show that immigration regime in destination the destination countries are a primary predictor of poor birth outcomes among racialized immigrant mothers in the US and Europe. So punitive immigration regimes are associated with um, more broadly um, social stress, racism related stress, and all that has um, longer, longer term effects on reproductive um, health. So here, um, I'm just going to try to summarize this very shortly. Um, so we can see that the rate of low birth weight vary um, between, among and between um, Black immigrant groups. And their distribution across neighborhoods with high, medium, or low uh, po poverty also varies. And this is for New York City. Um, and this, so this, this also highlights the importance of grand, more granular data. So look, when you, if you do do research on, on this area or otherwise, try to get the most granular data you can, because um, if you were to collapse all, of, like collapse all of these groups into one black immigrant group, you're not going to see these differences. You're not going to see sort of the more nuanced, um, because like you can see how, Haitian immigrants differ uh, differ in terms of their, their outcome, but also their, their social economic composition from Dominican uh, Republican immigrants. And though they're right, they're coming from the same island. But of course, there's a long history there, right? So thinking about immigration health, uh, sorry, immigration health in place. So this one, this, this also requires a relational approach because we are considering that immigration is, is a process, is a, is, so it's a process of displacement and emplacement. So people are leaving the place, their place of birth uh, or somewhere that they, that they lived for before they move. And they're, com and they're coming to a new, they're mo moving into a new context in their destination country. So this, this, this displacement is, is part of this broader continuum of emplacement. And emplacement is a term that medical and health geographers use to talk about um, place making, how people make a place a home, how people build communities. And so it, it encompasses uh, social capital, um, investment in their, their new community, and, and also just broad in, in a broader sense, participation. Um, so basically, relational and intersectional approaches are, are especially important for understanding health disparities within and between immigrant groups. Um, so for understanding the relationship between places and people. Um, and on the topic of segregation and birth outcomes, uh, or segregation and health outcomes more broadly, there's two um, competing hypotheses. There's first the segregation hypothesis, which um, posits that as the racial uh, so as racial or local racial ethnic composition uh, concentration increases, um, health outcomes worsen. 
And uh, the idea is that with this, uh, there's a broader, the idea is that there's a broader pattern of uh, racial ethnic composition, uh, con non-white racial ethnic uh, concentration being strongly coupled with concentrated disadvantage. And that has, uh, that influences uh, health outcomes in many ways, but generally in mostly negative ways. Um, the other, on the other end, you have the ethnic density hypothesis, which posits that as the local or ethnic or racial concentration increases, health outcomes improve. Um, and the, the uh, assumption there is that with uh, local ethnic and racial concentration, local uh, ethnic and racial uh, concentration, you have more social capital, more shared resources, um, even in the idea is that those can help overcome the uh, concentrated, any concentrate, concentrated disadvantage. Um, so segregation in health. Um, so broadly in studies of segregation in health, um, segregation negatively affects health outcomes of residents via racial discrimination. Um, so also racism related stress, which contributes to weathering or premature aging, limited access to economic opportunities, resources and services, and that includes um, health care. In many segregated metros in the US, um, majority black neighborhoods also have the worst spatial access to health care. Um, and that's on top of um, having generally higher un rates of uninsurance. Um, so that there's many facets of access that where majority black places are, or neighborhoods are disadvantaged. Um, exposure to environmental hazards via environmental racism and also poor housing quality. And uh, poor access to prenatal care. So prior research by my co-authors did find that um, majority, um, majority black, but particularly uh, majority even Asian uh, immigrant communities had poor access to prenatal care in New York City. Um, overall, the findings are inconsistent. They vary with the health, health outcomes of interest. They also vary with the study, study area and also how segregation is measured in those studies. Um, so the ethnic density hypothesis um, posits that immigration health is tied to local group density. And higher density implies um, more great, uh, greater access to social resources and services that are beneficial for health and coping and also more broadly social capital. Um, this hypothesis has been tested for many health outcomes, infant health, um, exclusion from, uh, perceived exclusion from social network, perceived risk, um, psychological distress, but overall there's been non-linear associations. Um, and here's a kind of a diagram where we can see that ethnic density is hypothesized to be associated with place-based social networks opportunities for social, positive social interactions, um, appropriate and accessible services and resources, um, social capital, and the outcome and the outcome is possible wellness. Um, of course, this is, there's a lot of ambigu ambiguity here because it's like, well, what's the scale of measurement? Um, are there any thresholds for the exposures of interest? Um, what, what are the processes that drive these outcomes or, or modify these outcomes? And so that, and that takes us to the, the second one, segregation, um, to the segregation hypothesis. So the, in this literature, we often see uh, references to racism related stress um, as, a, as also cumulative exposures to racial, uh, racial discrimination and also environmental exposures over time, which contribute to poor health. Um, the hype weathering hypothesis or um, points to premature aging via stress induced pathways that can affect the reprodu reprodu reproductive system and um, thus affect pregnancy and birth related outcomes. Um, in healthcare settings, and this is important too, uh, I don't cover this, but um, there's really great work on this. Um, in healthcare settings, obstetric race, racism contributes to inequities in birth outcomes. Uh, ob observed among Black, Latinx, and Indigenous patients. And obstetric racism takes the form of um, clinical decision-making that takes the perceived race 
or how the mother is racialized into account. Um, and like that often, uh, often leads to higher rates of C-sections, um, denial of pain medications and so forth um, in the birth process. And it contributes to um, traumatic birth outcomes, but also uh, traumatic birth experiences, but also negative birth outcomes. Um, here's a conceptual dialogue, a conceptual diagram for biological pathways between racial discrimination and um, adverse outcomes for maternal, uh, maternal health and birth infant health. Um, I'm sure you all are very familiar with this. Um, I, for the sake of this, for this project, I'm focusing on the macro social uh, factors and their influence on birth outcomes. So, I mean, this is not to denigrate biological um, models, but these, the focus, where the primary focus is biological mediators or uh, processes, we, we often fail to account for macro social context of interpersonal and structural racism prior to pregnancy, during pregnancy, and during birth. Um, so, the segregation hypothesis um, posits that. Residence in a segregated neighborhood is associated with greater exposure to racial segregation, limited access, so concentrated, dis concentrated disadvantage. So you have limited access to services, resources, and opportunities that can improve health, maintain health, and mitigate any the negative effects of, of, say, environmental exposures or other exposures that can harm health. Um, Racial segregation is also associated with chronic exposure to stressors and weathering or premature aging among racialized uh, non-white or racialized residents in those neighborhoods, and also environmental exposures. And the outcome is poor health or, or lack of wellness. So um, in studies of segregation and birth outcomes, there's been several ways of measuring segregation. Um, the study is quantitative, but I did want to acknowledge that there is a really important body of work uh, done by, by work researchers who use qualitative methods to study this. And those, um, those include uh, studies that use participant observation, case studies, focus groups, surveys. Um, for this study, we are drawing on the, the quantitative tradition. Um, there's a recent study by Nancy Krieger in New York City using the same data for actually a year later, where they used um, homeowners loan corporation maps from the 1930s, so the redlining map. They used those to draw the neighborhoods and, and uh, actually look at birth app, look at the associations with birth outcomes. And they did find a modest association between uh, the redlining of a neighborhood and adverse uh, and higher rates of low birth rate and um, preterm birth. Um, others are local spatial segregation index, which are based on are measures of interaction, and they're typically based on individuals. Uh, so you have, you take the individual level residential addresses, uh, people who gave birth or, or infants or mothers, of whatever your population of interest is. You take the individual uh, addresses and use those to measure the con uh, concentration and interaction in a given neighborhood. Um, there's also a relative ethnic density across continuous space, um, and these are measures of proximity. So for this study, we are, are extending a local spatial segregation index. So the research question for this one, this study is, how do ethnic density and racial segregation intersect to influence health outcomes for racialized immigrants? Um, so the full study does focus on African immigrants and immigrants from the Caribbean and South America, but we have preliminary studies for um, Black African immigrants in New York City. So that's what I'm gonna be presenting today. So uh, we're gonna be focusing on uh, preterm birth and low birth, uh, low birth weight um, among Black immigrants, Black African immigrants in New York City between 2009 and 2014. So overall, um, in the prior studies of ethnic density and birth weight, uh, birth outcomes, but here we have low birth weight, 
they're the, they're the for immigrant uh, communities, there's an overall U-shaped association where at the extremes, uh, so where there's low density, there, uh, birth weight, uh, so rates of low birth weight, weights of preterm birth are higher. And where, uh, in, and also where um, density is highest, you see the same pattern, but in the middle, you see the lowest rates of preterm birth and pre, uh, low birth weight. So um, the data for the study are from uh, New York Department of Health, New York City Department of Health vital records. So we have birth from 2009 to 2014. Uh, we only included singleton births and uh, birth to black uh, to mothers who were noted as being, as being born on the continent of Africa and coded as black. Um, for uh, the, at the at the track level, census track level, uh, or for the mother's residence, we have socioeconomic status and environmental variables, um, and we also include social demographic characteristics of the mother. So um, that's included in the record. So we have age, education, marital status, insurance coverage, and uh, social risk behaviors. Um, the outcome measures are low birth weight, which is defined as uh, weight as less than weight equal to a less, less than 2,500 grams at birth, and preterm birth, which is just birth at um, less than 37 weeks gestation. Unfortunately, unlike previous years, um, the New York Department of Health did not release data on the country of birth for the mother. So we, uh, we had to actually aggregate all the birth um, to African mothers into one category, uh, which is unfortunate, but this is the reality of working with um, non-public data. So here's the study area, New York, uh, New York City. Um, this is a figure from a previous map that shows um, places in the city that have high, high degrees of segregation and also high levels of poverty at the census tract level. And um, here in the, uh, in the Bronx and uh, Upper Manhattan, those are uh, areas where actually Black uh, African immigrants are highly represented. So overall, um, we, this is the summary statistics. We, uh, uh, the total sample included 100 and nearly 106, just a little bit over 164,000 births between 2009 and 2014. Um, for U.S. born Black women, um, the low birth rate, uh, so the prevalence of low birth weight uh, was about 11.4% compared with 7.3% for African born mothers. Um, for, in terms of preterm birth, um, U.S. born Black women had uh, uh, the prevalence was 11.8 compared to 7.4. Um, so this, this this, this is in keeping with previous studies that find that U.S. born Black women have higher rates of preterm uh, birth and low birth weight compared with African or immigrant, Black immigrant women. Um, here we have a, this is a map showing um, just where, the, I guess the concentration of birth to Black Black African immigrant mothers here in New, York, in New York City between 2009 and 2014. And you see there's a kind of a center of gravity in the Bronx and, and, and northern, uh, sorry, upper Manhattan, uh, parts of Brooklyn and Queens, and a small part of Staten Island. Um, so here's data based on earlier, earlier years. So here's on um, birth to Egyptian mothers. So we see that they're more heavily represented in Queens and um, Brooklyn. Here's for Nigerian mothers, so a lot more uh, stronger presence in um, the Bronx, Upper Manhattan, and Brooklyn. Um, so developing the local segregation and concentration measures. So we there's, there's, we, we calculate three uh, three values for each track. Um, so first, for each for class of study area. So first, we uh, we calculate the density of birth to African Black African immigrant mothers across New York City, and we do we do this using a kernel density estimation, which is um, you don't need to know all the details, but um, for it's it, 
geographers call it a spatial filtering method. So basically you smooth the data over the study period um, and we use a mile, uh, a mile, band, a mile wide bandwidth. Um, and we do the same across all of this. Uh, for the second measure, we measure the density of sub-Saharan African population using HDS data, track level data. And so then we again pr produce a smooth surface uh, over the study area using that. And then third, we calculate the density of percent black population. So this is black overall. So this is including non-immigrant uh, or US born black uh, population as well. Um, and then the third, the fourth step is to calculate the ratio of black population density to total population. So then, so now you have this measure of segregation. But then, you, but to, so essentially, the the outcome variable is um is uh is a ratio of the ratios. So where we have the rate the density of uh, sub-Saharan African African population divided by the density of um, black population. So um, overall, we find that um, the density of, so we do find that black African population in the US, so in New York City, it does not overlap very strongly with uh, US born, overall US born and immigrant black population in New York City. Um, so you see that in the, with the low correlation between um, black population density and percent black, which is 0 0.06. Um, track level, other track level variables we include in the model. The social economic, uh, track, uh, social economic variables include the poverty, track level poverty rate, and median household income. Um, environmental variables, we include proximity to parks and green space, and we calculate that using 800 uh, meter network buffer of the track population from the track around the track uh, population weighted century. So basically, if you have, just take for example, you have a census track, just like the square, but the, so you can have, you have a geographic centroid, which is exactly in the middle, but also the populated, uh, but in contrast, the population weighted centroid is where the sort of center of gravity for the population is. So it, it won't necessarily be in the center. It'll be where the most people are, where the mean center uh, of the population is. Um, and also we, we include uh, the number of street trees within 100 meters, 250 meters, and 500 meters network buffer of the track population weighted centroid. And um, the method overall is multi-level logistic regression. And uh, the first level is the moderate and individual level characteristics. And the second level is track level or neighborhood level characteristics. Um, in a previous study, um, Sarah McLafferty, who's a Kochmer, the first author of the study, found that there was a significant inverse association between nearby street trees and odds of preterm birth for all women. And but this association was greatest among women in neighborhoods with high levels of deprivation. Um, so basically in neighborhoods that had higher levels of deprivation, uh, the association between, um, so the association between, um, wow, okay. So the association between green, neighborhood greenness and positive uh, or lower rates of preterm birth and, and low birth weight was was strongest. So again, so overall, we do find that there is a U-shape uh, association for um, low birth weights. Uh, so for lo low birth weight and density of birth to uh, mothers born in Africa. And uh, the same is true for when you look at low birth weight uh, in relation to the density of sub-Saharan African population. Um, and contrast that with the overall US born black population where low birth weight among um, US born um, black residents in New York City uh, is overall, it's overall a negative association where as the share of black population increases, the 
Hmm. This one's interesting because there's a it's just like a slight uh, uptick at where the neighborhood composition is 70 per 70 percent black. So it's, it's, it's consistent with previous studies, which find that immigrant for immigrant, uh, particularly black immigrants, uh, there's a U-shaped association between low birth rates and preterm birth um, and neighborhood ethnic density. Whereas for a U.S. born black uh, resident you find that there is not a U-shape, it's a different association. Um, here again, we see the U-shape association. Um, I don't know how I can explain, I'll just read, read my notes here. Um, so what the U-shape association between uh, ethnic density and preterm birth and low weight birth weight means is that at the extremes, high Low, low and high degrees of ethnic density or segregation. And uh, so at, at the extreme, high, uh, so the extremes being high and low degrees of ethnic density, um, rates of low and low birth weight and preterm birth are higher. And that's for immigrant. However, for US born population, this, the, what we see is that the share of black population, as the share of black population increases, low birth weight declines except where the population share of resident is approximately 70%. Interestingly, we see the opposite for preterm birth. So like you can see here, it's sort of flipped. Oops. Um, that's worth investigating further. We don't have an answer for that one. Okay, so the statistical approach we run, uh, we ran a logistic regression model. Um, the app dependent variables were low birth weight and preterm birth. And at level one, we had individual characteristics or traits of individual uh, individual matters, so age, education, marital status. And at level two, we had census tract uh, uh, variables. So for the, the census tract that they reside in. So in segregation measures, poverty, park access and, and street street, the last two being measures of greenness. And um, so what we find is that overall, um, where, so at the extremes again, where, so where uh, African population density is highest and African population density is lowest, you see uh, um, that there's a positive association with um, low birth weight. Um, and in the adjusted model, we see that low group density is associated with higher rates of low birth weight among African mothers in New York City, while park access, so proximity to, a, a, to parks or green space actually reduces, is associated with a reduction or lower uh, risk, a lower rate of low birth weight among African mothers in New York, African immigrant mothers in New York City. Um, and um, here, so here are the models for preterm birth. We find again that at the extremes where, where there's high density and low density, uh, the, the rates of, so, sorry, the risk of preterm birth is higher at the extreme to where there's high density and low density of mothers, but also high, uh, high density, high group density for Af African immigrants in New York City. Um, and in the, in the adjusted model, we, do, we see that both access to parks and, and uh, the, the, the number of street trees in proximity to where, they, to where the mothers live is associated with lower, uh, lower odds or low, yeah, lower odds of um, preterm birth. So overall, uh, the summary of the findings where immigrant mothers, where black immigrant mothers live is important for infant health. Um, overall, we do see a U-shaped relationship between ethnic density and risk of low birth weight and preterm birth. Um, we do not find an, any in, a significant, a statistically significant impact of Black population concentration on birth outcomes among African immigrants. And um, neighborhood and individual level uh, social economic status was not significant, were not significant predictors of preterm birth a low birth weight in this sample in the, between 2005 and 2014. And finally, access to green spaces, so such as parks and street trees, um, was associated with positive outcomes. So lower rates of preterm birth and lower rates of um, 
low birth weight. Um, so key limitations of this study, I would say we did not have data for the country, mothers of country of origin. Um, we do not have that, we do not have more longitudinal data on the length of residence in the U.S. because we know that is associated with worsening health outcomes over time. Um, Segregation measures, um, we only, we're only measuring concentration and not exposure. So exposure, we're often interested in a dose, like doses, but also duration. Um, so for this study, we we're only able to consider the place of residence. And that's actually, frankly, a lot more data than most people studying the topic get. But that is still a pretty uh, considerable limitation. Um, generalizability. Um, Oh, also contextual effects are, are relatively small and um, in terms of generalizability, we have to understand that New York City is, may not be representative of other places in the United States. So um, in conclusion, I don't know what time it is, but in conclusion, places and populations intersect in complex ways to shape immigrant health. And, but we need to understand processes, links between ethnic density and isolation and coping strategies, social networks, and resources. And we also need to understand, better understand and continue to investigate how natural built and socioeconomic environments and opportunities intersect to affect health inequities within and between immigrant populations. And also between immigrant and US born populations. Okay, I'm gonna check the chat. I'm sorry about that. So we should have um, plenty of time for some questions, Dr. Planey, if you have finished your conclusions and I can kind of moderate the question and answer session from here. Okay, what's the question? Okay, so um, is the green space finding a proxy for something else? Um, when I read the literature on green space and health, I always, almost always believe that it's a proxy for something else. Um, we're, because we controlled for social economic, area level social economic characteristics, we can rule out that, we can rule that out. Um, I know New York City is kind of an interesting case where green spaces are kind of clustered. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Another question um, came through asking about other useful environmental and socioeconomic variables that one can derive from census tract data when they're doing studies like this? Um, so I know um, ACS has a few, I don't know about going forward, but I know in the past ACS has collected data on housing quality, um, plumbing availability. Um, you can possibly get from county health departments, uh, measures of say lead in the water or soil. Um, I know Pittsburgh has that data. Um, and because like, you know, we, we like, just so you can be creative, depending on what outcomes you're interested in, what exposures you're interested in, there's a lot of ways you can approach this. Um, this is a, a question asking for your recommendation on um, other variables we could use to describe populations uh, in, in studies to try to capture the effects of structural racism until there's another better, more rigorously co collected um, uh, variable available for observational and randomized trials when we're talking about health outcomes in this race or on this population, um, taking into account that structural racism contributes to how we are classifying people. Right, and that's what is where um, mo where approaches like multi-level modeling are useful, where you can kind of get cross-level, you can ha even have cross-level interaction. So if you're interested in say, individual like to mother, social economic status, education and so forth, and in relation to area level or neighborhood level characteristics, you can do that. Um, so can, kind of get a sense of concentrated or collective disadvantage versus individual advantage or disadvantage. You know, there are a lot of ways you can do that. Another question, that may be our last question, um, was asking um, on behalf of clinicians, it, as, as we're seeing patients, um, if those patients have had access to care, um, are there any evidence-based tools that you know of that can help address obstetric racism um, other than knowledge sharing and, and participating in, in um, 
gaining knowledge in discussions like these? Um, I don't want to, I don't think, I, w I wouldn't be comfortable dictating to a clinician, to clinicians what they should do, but I would say for sure, listen to black women. I mean, listen to our patients. I mean, it's not just women who get birth. Um, we, there's plentiful evidence showing that um, clinicians and institutions do not listen to patients. They don't listen to the pain complaint. They don't listen to, they're not, they're not necessarily enabling care coordination and continuity. Um, before I go, I did want to address uh, the last comment. Um, Yes, census data are limited in uh, social, economic, and demographic characteristics. Um, but I think one advantage of this study is that we use census chat rather than zip codes. There's a recent study showing that um, census, like when you're looking for quantitative modeling, census chat actually account for about 75% of um, uh, contribution to health, that health status at the population level. Yeah, um, so I'm happy to talk further. I don't want to encroach on our time, but um, so the question, the comment is, much of the structural racism literature focuses on neighborhood level segregation. Interested in your strategy to identify more proximal structural racism measures for inequities in maternal and reproductive health. Um, this is where it's really important to have more a more interdisciplinary uh, approach. Um, so, you know, from the health services research angle, that including um, claims data to capture utilization, um, or for you know, sociologists and geographers who act have who primarily use demographic data, looking at um, access to you know, insurance and unemployment. Um, but all overall, just look incorporating contextual variables, but having a strong theoretical grounding for why you use those variables. Um, also, multi-level overlap in preterm birth and low birth. We actually, we ran the model separately. So basically, we had, a, we, we used one big list of births between 2009 and 2014. We had each individual mother, residential location, race, or and how they were coded as race, uh, what their immigration status, and so forth. Perfect. Yes, you're right. There is a strong association. Uh, there's a strong link between low birth weight and preterm birth. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Planey. I um, am very excited that we were able to um, welcome you to UNC and kind of uh, introduce you to the community this way. Thank you for participating and for answering these questions. I know um, in our emails, you uh, mentioned you could share these slides and we have um, lots of ways that we can disseminate them to people who weren't able to join today and uh, post them up on our Medium page. So if you're willing to do that, I'm sure, I'm sure our participants yeah. would really appreciate it. I'll send along the PDF right after this meeting. Excellent. And then I um, did want to call the participants' attention to the link in the chat uh, that you can visit to complete an after a, a post-lecture survey. Um, and I will also share it here so that you can see it. Perfect here. Um, thank you guys for, for participating and for, for spending part of your afternoon with us. Next month, we will feature doc, uh, Mr. Paul Quadros, uh, who is speaking on the theme, This Land is Our Land. So look out for the RSVP link and please reach out to us with questions or comments or suggestions. Thanks again for, for sharing your time with us and everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Planey. Thank you.